Hello. This case is a 17 day old girl. The body weight is 2.8 kg. And she was diagnosed as tricuspid atresia with pulmonary atresia, duct dependent pulmonary circulation. And she was shifted to our hospital on prostaglandin infusion. This is the pre procedure echocardiography. As you can see, there is a vertical tortuous duct from the undersurface of the arch. And it's draining into the PA confluence here. And this is the PA confluence, and you can appreciate there is a, a moderate to severe RP origin stenosis. We got a CT scan where you can see the confluent branch pulmonary arteries. This is the 3D reconstructed image, which is flipped 180 degree. So this is the RPA. So RPA origin is stenosed, and there is no MPS stump. We calculated ductal tortuosity index, which came like two, and ductus curvature index is three. So we are planning for a ductal stenting, uh, encroaching the stent up to the RPA origin in view of RPA origin stenosis. Our approach, we would prefer a left axillary approach based on the origin of the ductus. The length of the ductus, we measured approximately 16 millimeter. And the diameter of the stent, considering the weight of the child less than 3 kg, and it's a single ventricle physiology, we are planning for a stent of 3.5 millimeter which would be inflated up to 3.8 millimeter. So this is a, this is a baby, 19, day, 19 days old female baby. His diagnosis is pulmonary atresia and tricuspid atresia. We have taken this child for ductal stenting because it is a duct dependent pulmonary circulation. So usually these cases, what we do here is we shift all the, these, all these units we shift here in the cath lab on the cord. We, as an anesthesiology, we induce the patient properly and uh, uh, once you stabilize on the ventilator, we take a neckline in a completely sterile fashion. We put inotropes, all the inotropes, noradrenaline, adrenaline in a prophylactic manner to the uh, one of the lumen of the triple lumen, and then we stabilize and then we hand over the patient to the uh, to, to be shifted on the cath lab to proceed for the further procedure. Good day, everyone. So, this is team NSH once more. So uh, I am accompanied by my colleagues, Dr. Sanjeevan, Dr. Jaita, and Dr. Madhurima. And uh, I mean, uh, we are today we are doing a doctor stenting procedure, and Madam uh, Dotto is with us as an anesthetist. Plus, we have our cath lab crew and our other team members. So today we are doing a doctor stenting for a child with tricuspid atresia, pulmonary atresia, who is now about 18 days old and was transferred to us from another hospital on prostin is weighing about 2.8 kilos. So this is basically a single ventricle pulmonary atresia. So we did, a, we uh, the child was on prostin, the sepsis screen being negative, we have taken for ductless stenting this morning. So the uh, standard accesses which we do is, we have a neck access with a 4.5 French uh, triple lumen. And apart from that, we have an arterial line, that is 22 gauge uh, arterial line on the right, axilla, uh, right groin, and a left axillary access, which we have done with the five French radial sheet. There is a five French thermo sheet, which uh, has been there is just up to the point which we have introduced just up to the point where the axillary artery, I mean, the, where the supplement artery is originating. So the first step we did was to get an angiogram through a five French uh, sheet angiogram. Thereafter, we have repeated the angiograms through our five French uh, RCA catheters. So thereafter, while one of the persons that is by usually it is my my part that i stay on the this side of the patient on the left side of the patient and i guide the catheter in right of the duct and my colleagues on that side they usually thread the duct so the duct was threaded with a run through wire and we have parked our first wire into the left pulmonary artery deep inside the left pulmonary artery but as you can see on the echocardiogram and on the ct uh, ct angiogram we, today we had a confluence stenosis more on the right pulmonary artery. That is the reason we thought that probably we would uh, make our stent go a little bit deeper into the right pulmonary artery because so that there might not be any differential growth of the branch pulmonary arteries. We erred on the side of the right pulmonary artery in the sense that probably the LPA can grow on its own, but the right pulmonary artery was stenosed. That's why we thought that we'll put the stent a little bit inside the right pulmonary artery. So the leg come next comes the length of the stent. Depending on the measurements we have taken on the CT angio plus the measurement of our of our floppy tip, that is a uh, radiolucent floppy tip, we thought that today we'll take a 15 millimeter stent, 3.5 millimeter 
the alpine stain and we will put that into the right pulmonary artery. So once we have uh, taken a buddy wire and we have <coughs> parked it inside the right pulmonary artery in a secure position, <coughs> we have taken up the wire from the left pulmonary artery, we have secured the position and we have confirmed our positions from different angiograms from different angles. So as you can see on this angiogram, so we have kept the stent a little bit inside the RPA. The question is, where do we keep the aortic end? As you can see on subsequent angiograms, the aortic end is flushed almost at the floor of the <coughs> transverse aorta. In this particular angiogram, you can see that the aortic end is almost right up to the origin of the subclavian artery. So we pushed it slightly inside and we have placed it just flushed with the floor of the Aorta. As you can see in this last angiogram, this is the last angiogram taken before the stent was inflated. So the stent was inflated right up to the diameter of 3.8 millimeters and we have taken out the balloon slowly. <coughs> before the balloon was taken out, we gave the final injection. If you can show the final injection after the stent was dilated, go on please. The next angiogram. <coughs> yeah. So now you can see the balloon is being inflated. This inflation and the stent is taken a good position covering the length of the whole length of the duct. Now it is 3.8 millimeters. The origin of the right pulmonary artery was 1.5 to 2 millimeters. That's why we have put it inside the right pulmonary artery. And this is the ultimate angiogram. You can see that end of the duct or end of the stent is past the right pulmonary artery origin and the aortic end is just flushed with the floor of the aorta. So now my colleague will take the balloon out and will go for the shield injection. So, so far, so good. So as you can see, we have taken out the balloon and there's one understanding here. As you can see in this angiogram, last angiogram, piece, last angiogram. Now the support of the balloon and the wire is gradually coming off. That means the stent so far has been on the support. We have seen this phenomena quite a number of times. So what happens is, since the aorta was, uh, I mean, the aortic floor was almost flush with the stent, or rather the stent was slightly peeping into the aortic floor by about, say, one to two millimeters, because if we put the whole transverse aorta was 4.5 millimeters, however big you might see here, the whole transverse aorta was 4.5 millimeters, and we were afraid that we might jail the transverse aorta. In that case, sometimes we have faced thromboembolism and thrombosis of the stent in those cases, and also at the same time, the stent might be, the flow might be hampered to some extent. Here we thought that we'll just flush it with the aorta, aortic floor. And uh, thereafter, you can see when the uh, balloon has been taken off, the aortic end is slightly inclined to the angle. Interestingly, when you see the echocardiogram, you will find that incidentally, before the stenting, we found that the mouth of the aortic end, that the aortic end is facing towards the right side. But here you can see that the wire has actually straightened it out so much so that now it's almost flush with the aorta. Now, an interesting thing will happen, just we, which we noticed later on. Next frame, please. Next angio. Now you see the wire has been totally taken off and the stent has slightly lied down, slightly lied down and it is still flushed with the aorta. You've seen from the different angles from the echocardiogram, as you can see. So the very first turn, the very first turn of the aortic end might have been missed by a whisker so that the aortic, aortic end is slightly, oh, I mean, slightly of the, I mean, the stent is just off the aortic end, but the stent has not migrated. It is by virtue of the anatomy by virtue of the I mean, uh, uh, nature of the duct, which has been, uh, these things might happen in subjection. But since the aortic end is missed by a whisker, we don't think that the stent, uh, I mean, there will be any, any evidence of low flow or thromboembolism in this one, whatever small experience we have. That is the reason we didn't opine for any further stents or further maneuvers in this particular stent. The saturation is already 93% and uh, we have not gone for any further venture. And you can show the echocardiogram, which Sanjeevan is showing now. Echo big, echo big curve. So if you can see, the stent is still flushed along with the uh, aorta. And you can see good flow. And actually, in actuality, you can see that the, there is some flow through the aorta, which is actually hitting the <coughs> aortic end of the stent. There is good flow seen through the stent. Some amount of reversibility, flow reversibility in the descending thoracic aorta, which uh, shows the adequacy of the stent flow and there is good flow into the branch pulmonary arteries 
which are quite adequate. And as per our protocol, what we do is we stop the prostin just entering the cath lab, or in sometimes, sometimes when the baby is extremely blue, we stop the prostin just after we cross the uh, PDA. The reason being, we had some experience, whatever small experience we have, that sometimes while uh, tickling the duct and the prostin is off, the duct might again go into spasm making the procedure very very difficult where we might have to restart the prostin because the wire end the coronary wire end with which we cross might actually force the duct to go into a spasm you can see the pulmonary venous inflow now pulmonary venous return is quite okay and thereafter what we do is according to our protocol as soon as the ductal stenting has been done we start the baby on noradrenaline and adrenaline support so that the diastolic pressure is uh, not too low. Most of the times, the diastolic pressure remains in the 20s or rather late 20s, so that, uh, and rather in the early 30s, so that there is adequate amount of diastolic pressure to for the coronary filling. And here also, you can see that is the flow reversible in the descending first aorta is not much. It's at best mid systole, mid diastole, sorry. And thereafter, the diastolic pressure as of now on board is 21 so i have increased the norad slightly is flush to the aorta the aortic end there is a contradiction from the angiogram and the echocardiogram and there are the, there is good flow through the stent for the diastolic pressure which is low will immediately increase the this one uh, noradrenaline and there is on adrenaline support as a routine we use eptifibatide on table through the sheet and uh, after that we transfer the baby in a warm cot so the FT fever tide as a routine we give so that the stent flow is maintained and there is no evidence of thromboembolism. That's all of now.